Welcome listeners to a brand new bonus episode of Oh My Word Podcast. And today we have a really special guest with us. We have story artist. Also, I'm adding in my commentary, super, super talented individual and in parentheses, Chuck Greeb. Chuck, welcome to the podcast. Hi, and thanks for having me. I am so excited to have you. Also because I've seen your work on social media and I've seen your work in person also. So it's a very exciting opportunity. So just because we always start from the beginning, how did you become a story artist or illustrator or whatever you want of animation, all the stuff that you've done? How did you even get started in all this? Well, it's kind of funny, really. It's a, it's a funny story and you can read it. I put a little blurb about it up sometimes like on my website, but it really began when I was a very young boy. I was, I think, three years old. And I know I'm going way back, yeah. but I was watching Saturday morning. They used to have like the creature double feature. Yeah. And I was watching that on television with my father. And they had this movie, Jason and the Argonauts on. And Ray Harryhausen, I learned, was the name of the artist and animator who created the monsters in this movie. And they were just wonderful. And they were these skeletons that came up out of the ground and attacked Jason and his crew. And I was just blown away as a little kid. And I said to my dad, how did they do that? Keep in mind, I'm like three or four years old. (laughs) And he looks at the TV and he has no idea. So he just lied. He said, they got skinny actors. (laughs) (laughs) And I I was at the television set, my hands on the screen, looking, thinking, nobody's that skinny. Now, again, (laughs) even at that age, I wasn't buying it. And by the time I was seven years old, I was building my first stop motion animation armature. See that lie, and it's why you probably shouldn't lie to your children. It really was the starting point. That little obsession began with that experience. I went to the library and I got booked out on it and I read about how this man made these characters. And that began kind of my quest to ultimately end up making animation-related and story-related art. So that's really where it started. And of course, there's other things that happen along the way, but that was the spark. Okay, so just to recap for a second, skeletons coming out of the ground in a cartoon is what sparked your interest. It wasn't a cartoon. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's right. It was live action. That's right. And they mixed it with these puppets. But the puppets were so well done. You know, these days they would do it all with computers. But it's like, you know, in Star Wars, when they had those giant walking adats that were attacking the ice planet. Right. They were models, you know, that were moved just a little bit at a time and composited with the live action. And that's what this artist Ray Harryhausen was doing. This is from back in like 1958 or something. So people are making this kind of magic for a long time. It's just these days, it's arguably become easier with the digital technology. But with optical technology, they were doing it. Anyway, that was just... So cartoon isn't even quite right because it was animation, but it was mixed with real people and it was puppets and anyway, yeah. That was the start. That was the impetus. That's so great and a little bit scary at the same time. (laughs) You're like, hands out of the ground. Yes, we want this. Well, so that's interesting though that you went for more on like a, I guess you could say a drawing sort of path instead of like the puppet prop path or I don't know what we'd call that. Well, I've done it all actually. Oh, okay. I, you know, as a young person, I was just so enamored with the idea of taking something and giving it life. I think that was the thing that was so magical was creating this reality that wasn't real, you know? and the magic in that and I did pursue stop motion animation but when I was a young person in college it was right around the end of stop motion animation as the tool being used for this kind of effect and the development of the digital technology so I I was watching that transition happen and I was also learning about filmmaking and I was learning about animation and drawing cartoons. So it all kind of came together. And I've had the opportunity to do 3D digital. I've done stop motion. And I've done a lot of drawn work, like you mentioned. I mean, my professional career has been predominantly in the animation industry, drawing storyboards and drawing animation. And that's something that you specifically went to college for, to learn those things specifically? You know, I went to college really to learn stop motion, but I learned those <laughs> things 
because I re- <laughs> this is funny too. I was in on my undergraduate experience in Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania, and the teacher who taught animation was asking the different students what their interests were. And I said, "Well, I'm really interested in stop motion animation." And he looked at me and he said, "Yeah, I don't really know anything about that." <laughs> <laughs> And I was just like, well, that doesn't matter. I'm still going to do it. And I did. <laughs> but I learned a lot about drawn animation. And then when I went to graduate school at the University of Southern California, I connected with some other people who were making animation. And we kind of worked together. We worked on group projects and we supported each other on our own individual projects. And they were all drawn animation. And at this time, Beauty and the Beast came out and Aladdin came out. And it was a very exciting time for drawn animation. It was a real renaissance time. And storyboarding was something I found I really enjoyed. And storyboarding is something that's done for both live action and animation. And in storyboarding, what you do is you create a series of images that tell the story. They show where the camera would be placed, who's going to be in the scene, how they're feeling, what they do. And those drawings, they look something like a comic strip or something like a comic book. Oh, yeah. Like a graphic novel. Kind of, but within the context of film. So like with a graphic novel, you'll have different sized panels. Right. You don't do that in film because, you know, your TV set or your movie screen doesn't change. Right, yeah. But you are thinking carefully about how to structure all of the story information visually to best engage the audience. And that's became really, I think, my focus and interest through this initial attraction to stop motion animation and the technique of it. But I realized it wasn't the technique so much as it was the magic of that world, that place, that story that I felt engaged with. And so storyboarding is the kind of role where you are making the choices about how to best engage your audience and tell the story. And most of my professional career has been as a storyboard artist or as an animator doing drawn animation. Though I've actually done a bit of 3D digital and cutout animation as well. And I played around with stop motion, so I've had a chance to do a lot of different things. It's been, uh, it's been fun. Wow. And then, so just to go back, for a few things. When you went to graduate school, was that just a personal choice or was that something you were recommended to do for as a professional? The older folks will remember how it was. Before there was the internet, information, <laughs> yeah. information was hard to come by. And I'm the first person in my family to have gone to college. Oh, wow. So mm-hmm. I'm coming from a very, I guess, an experience where we didn't even understand how it all worked. It's like a mystery. But you want to go. And, you know, my mother wanted my brothers and I to go because she wanted us to have a better life than she did. So college is that gateway. And as a young person, when I wanted to go to college, I was just doing all the research I could. I mean, I, I sent a lot of letters and I got catalogs from every university in the country that offered a program that was called anything related to cinema. Oh, wow. I had those Peterson's books, the College Board published books on all the majors and all of the programs. And I just cross-referenced them all. And I just sent these things out and I just sent for information and we didn't have any money. So I really was kind of confined to a state school in the state where I lived. But there were four schools in the state and I investigated each one and decided on the one that I thought would be most, <laughs> the most affordable and the one that would provide me the opportunity to maybe begin to learn. And I had a lot of fun in college and I learned a lot, but I also didn't learn a lot because there was only one teacher teaching animation, but he wasn't actually an artist oh. and he had never worked in the animation industry. So there was still a huge mystery. And I saw graduate school as First of all, it was in Southern California, so it was close to the industry, and I hoped it would give me the kind of professional, specific professional training and connections that would help me to make that next step in my career. So when you say, was it necessary or recommended to me, I don't think anyone recommended it, but I decided I would benefit from that experience because I didn't feel prepared after my undergraduate experience. Yeah, well, if your professor told you that he doesn't know anything about the one thing you went to college for. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I don't want to talk the school down at all. I yeah. mean, I had a wonderful, I have a very, very fond memories of my undergrad. It's a very different program today. I know the yes. people who teach there and they're terrific. And that man, what he was trying to do was he was trying to speak to the interest of the young people studying with him. He didn't go about setting up this program and saying, oh, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm right. going to do it anyway. What happened is students 
were interested in animation. And the students really took the initiative and he saw that drive and he was just doing his best to help facilitate that. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, and Edinburgh has grown and they've got a much larger and many more opportunities today. So for young people in Pennsylvania, it's really nice to be able to look back at my undergrad and see that they can have grown and, and, and developed even further than when I was a student there. Yeah, that's great. Because it's not so much whatever it was, but it's also how much far it's gone. Yeah. So just to also ask about storyboarding, um, so you're creating these images of either, I guess, a particular scene or whatever it is. What sort of information are you given? Are you given a script and it's like, look, we need this scene to be mapped out, so map out this scene? Or how does that, like, how does that actual process work? That's an excellent question. And it does vary a little bit, but I'm going to okay. give you, I worked predominantly in television animation. And there are two predominant ways or methods that are employed. Now, every production is different, but I'm going to give you the two predominant methods of storyboarding. One is where you are handed a script or an episode, or if it's a particularly long episode, you might be given one third or half of the script. And episodic television animation is usually either 11 minutes per episode or 22, depending on the type of piece it is. So let's just say you get an 11 minute script and you sit down and you read the script and then you interpret what the script is described as a series of, sh of shots. We call them scenes in animation, but I think the lay person would know them as shots and sequences. And you establish where the camera is placed. You place the environment, you put the characters into the environment, and then you pose them out. You direct the actors in a sense. Now, the actors, of course, are the characters, and the animator is going to make them come alive, but your performance is what they look to as the direction. So it's both filmmaking decisions and acting. Now, that's a script-based production, and usually you will produce something like, oh gosh, anywhere from 700 to 900 drawings. What? For an 11-minute show. 700 hmm? to 900? Yeah, I would estimate that's probably the norm for a, an 11 minute production. Wow. And then the other way that they make television animation is called premise based. In a premise based show, they hand you an idea. It might be a couple paragraphs. I worked on a show that was premise based with my wife. She's also a story artist and we were collaborating on this particular production. And the show was called My Life as a Teenage Robot. Mm -hmm. And in that production, it was a premise based show. They gave us a few paragraphs written down describing the idea of the story. But then we actually wrote the story as we do the storyboards. Oh, wow. So here you're writing the dialogue, you're really defining all the gags, you're, you know, it's just an idea. And the show we did was called My Puppet Bride. It's similar, intentionally similar to the story of Frankenstein and the idea of Frankenstein wanting a bride. So we had a lot of fun coming up with those ideas. Now, premise-based productions obviously require a little bit more work because you're not just doing the production board part that you do when you do a script, you're also writing it. So you usually get a little bit more time, ideally, or they'll have you work with another person so you share some of that responsibility. And hopefully you can get that done in the scheduled time. So those are the two predominant ways the storyboard artists work. The storyboard really does become the blueprint for the production. So everybody looks at it. The background artists look at it to see how the background should be. The animators look at it to see how the performance should be it becomes the visual blueprint from which the show is made so where does a director come in on all that because isn't some of that stuff that a director would usually uh... that is a very common perception and you are correct the layperson's understanding of the director is well wait aren't they picking the shots aren't they directing the actors yeah in television animation and even in feature animation, the director certainly is going to say, if he sees something you did and doesn't like it, he's going to say, hey, change that. Yeah. <laughs> but they are casting on their production artists who they believe are going to do a good job telling these stories. And then when you first get your hand out from the director, like when they give you the premise or they give you the script, they'll talk to you. They'll say, you know, this is what I'm thinking of. And you, you're like, oh, that's cool. Okay. And then you do the work and you show it to the director. And then the director gives you input. And the director's doing this with all of the artists on the production. So the director is kind of a creative manager. They're creative. So it's not like management in the sense of just, you know, making 
making sure schedules are met or anything. They're managing the creativity of all the different creative individuals working for them. And it's not just the story artists. They're talking to the character designers. They're talking to the background painters. They're going to be in there directing the voice talent as the recordings are made of the voice performances. So that director is pulled in so many different directions. And depending upon their role, they might also be giving direction to the writers. So a showrunner, which sometimes the director, sometimes it's the executive producer, the titles can vary. They've got to have this big picture and they have to trust the story artists that they've employed to be able to get their vision into a way that it will be communicated on the screen. Right. That's kind of what a director does. Yeah, that makes sense. And then how does it work as a storyboard artist? Do you usually get in with the studio and then you become like their in-house storyboard artist? Or you're kind of like any sort of, say, free agent, like any sort of writer or actor? Like you're moving around or are you in one place? That was a long you way know, of saying it's that. it's a yeah. little of both. <laughs> Okay. Um, it usually, you'll get cast on a production and you'll be on that production. So let's say a show gets greenlit at a studio, you'll get cast and you'll probably be on that show while it's in production. So let's say it does a season. Okay. You've been on the show for that season. If the season wraps and it doesn't get greenlit for another production, hopefully that studio will find another production to cast you on. And again, it's not unusual for someone just, especially if they're quite good, to stay at a single studio. But it's also not unusual for someone, even if they're good, doesn't have to do with their talent depends on their inclination and the opportunities as well yeah but you might bounce around to another studio but usually you find yourself on a production for its duration and then if let's say that show got picked up for another season you'd probably stay on it and you could be on a show for four or five years heck there are people who have been on the simpsons their entire career yeah because that show never ends <laughs> and then do you also have an agent or you got to get yourself your jobs you know it's not a very large industry okay and some people will have agents but it's more the exception than the rule. Oh. It really isn't that necessary. This business, it's actually bigger than it's ever been. But still, I think the Animation Union has about 6,000 members. And that's big. When I first started, I think it was around, I think it was less than 2,000 members. And that's oh, wow. all of the creative artists. Oh, and wow. writers. So the industry just isn't that big. So everyone kind of gets to know everybody else. And it's almost all in Burbank and every major cartoon studios union. So it all kind of works out that way. You don't tend to need an agent to find work. Right. Sometimes, you know, I've had an attorney help negotiate a contract, but most of the time we're just, you know, doing our thing. Yeah. <laughs> it works out just fine. Yeah, well, I guess also if they have a particular style in mind, that's also going to narrow down their choices. So It does. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you do. And in television animation, again, there are two overriding genres, I would say. I know okay. genre is a funny word, but yeah. <laughs> in television, they tend to either consider a show an action show or a comedy. Okay. Now, of course, you've got nuance and even, you know, a little bit of a mix in there, but those are the two predominant ways that shows are categorized. And I mentioned the different episodic lengths for television. And you know what? Netflix is just changing everything. Yeah. The streaming. But still, those are kind of the, the traditional ways that it's been looked at. And it's still kind of looked at that way. And an action show normally would be a series of 22-minute episodes. A 22-minute episode fills a half-hour block of program. And then a comedic show normally is a series of 11-minute episodes. And you'll two episodes in a half-hour block. So if you sit down to watch Spongebob, yeah. you'll get two Spongebobs, right? But if you sit down and watch Batman, you get one Batman. Same time. That's just kind of how they... I don't know who made these decisions, but that's <laughs> been how it's been working forever. For kid shows, like all the learning sort of kid shows, do those fall under, are they their own category or are those considered more like the quote unquote comedic 11 minute ones? Such a good long? question. I yeah. forgot about those. Um, yeah, <laughs> those are called preschool. <laughs> and I, I, gosh, I've never worked on preschool shows. Okay. I think they're 11 minutes though, but I'm not sure. But they are definitely another genre. You are correct. They do kind of fall on that comedic idea, but they're not really. And they are a different kind of storyboarding. It's a little quieter. There's less cutting. They're a little more flatly staged. The timing is different. And it's its own kind of way of thinking and a different approach. So if you're working on something like Dora the Explorer, you're going to handle that very differently than if you're working on Teen Titans. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> that's true. Um, no, that was an excellent question. Oh, yeah. thank you. Yay. So just, there's so much about this, but just because I want to cover some other things. You eventually, you left animation, or I don't know, I don't know how much of that, you know, how much detail you want to go into that. 
and then you transferred over to become you're now a teacher or professor and you're also now working on your own projects so was that sort of like okay I, I did my thing here I'm gonna go chase the dream or was that things were changing and it was different and I left it or like how did that all play and that you moved on from the animation studios well it's kind of funny because I'm a really shy person and the idea of speaking in front of other people is like my biggest fear yet here I am and now I'm a college <laughs> professor and that's my job and what happened is uh, I received a phone call out of the blue from this old animator by the name of Dave Brain, really nice guy. And he's someone with a long history in this business going back to like Sleeping Beauty, which is pretty cool. Wow. Anyway, he <laughs> said, hey, Chuck, would you like to teach a class? Huh? And I was like, huh? <laughs> I said, I, I never thought of myself being a teacher. Can I think about it? He's like, sure. So I went home and I talked to my wife. Now, my wife used to be an elementary school art teacher before she began her career as a story artist in animation. And I used to have fun coming up with lesson plans with her. And she said, oh, you should just try it. And if you don't like it, never do it again. And Good I advice. said, oh, okay. So I tried it. And I fell in love with teaching. Well, and I began teaching one night a week while I was working full-time in the animation industry. And I taught at Glendale Community College, I think, for, oh, gosh, nine years? A long time. One night a week. And I just loved it. And then the opportunity at Cal State Fullerton just showed up. And I, I thought, oh, it might be fun to do this full-time, you know? And so I applied, and they hired me, and well, I'm still there. So oh, wow. I just fell in love with it. And, you know, one of the things that really captured me was when I saw that positive impact I could have in a person's life, just, I remember at Glendale, I taught the one class, and it was a drawing class, a drawing for animation. And I said, you know, we thought maybe we'd create a new class in principles of animation. Would you teach it? I'm like, sure. <laughs> and then they said, hey, could you do another one where they make films? And so I kept making new classes and I had the same group of students going through each of these courses for like a year and a half. And at the end, the change I saw, the growth, the impact that, you know, what I had shared with them had had on them, it was really, I don't know, it just energized me. And I really found myself engaged with this idea of teaching young people how to make animation. And I found that so exciting, I decided to ultimately make the change to becoming a full-time professor. And it also, like you said, I do my own things. I, I still continue to freelance in the animation industry for a number of years while I was working full-time. But then I started making my own films and so getting them into festivals. So I've made three animated shorts and they screened in over 90 festivals all over the world. That was fun. And then, <laughs> I hope I'm not going on too long, but something kind of interesting happened in, I think it was 2013. This artist by the name of James Gurney visited the school where I teach. Hmm. And James Gurney created this world called Dinotopia. And I don't know if you remember it, but it was a huge hit in like the early 90s when it first came out. And they took this world that he'd created and they made like a mini series out of it and there was he, he illustrated a set of books and these weren't exactly children's books but they could be perceived as such because kids enjoyed them but adults right. did too they were illustrated by him with these oil paintings and it was accompanied with prose that he had written telling the stories of the characters and i think he's written and illustrated four or five of them so he visited and he talked about just what he was doing and with these paintings and his process and he builds little models that he uses as reference and i was in the audience and my most recent film was almost done and i was listening to him i thought gosh when i was a kid i really liked to paint and i haven't painted anything in like 20 years huh. and i just got jazzed again about something else <laughs> and i thought i'd like to do that so when my film was done i almost started another film and i thought wait a minute i was gonna paint something so i started painting and the first painting i did actually got into this annual and that was really encouraging you yes. know <laughs> so i submitted it and got into this publication and i started writing stories about those characters and showing it that what i was doing to people and they're like hey you know you should join scbwy this looks like something kids would like and so that's kind of how i ended up with me talking to you today i think yeah it's true <laughs> i saw because you post a lot of your work on social media so everyone should go follow Chuck on social media. It's so worth it. So there's one painting that you did with like the wolf and Red Riding Hood or something. And uh -huh. she's got like a cross or, or bow. I don't know if it's a bow and arrow or a crossbow. That painting is amazing because you feel like the wolf is like looking at you, but also you know he's going after her and she's standing there and she's already like, you see that moment frozen. But what do you do with all your, this is a totally random question. What do you do with all your paintings? Because 
If you're painting, a lot of people now paint, uh, like they'll do everything digitally. But if you've got uh, actual paintings, like where do you put them all? <laughs> well, well, first of all, I do participate in events where I sell my work. Ah, there you go. <laughs> so I participate in this annual event called IX. Uh, it's this convention devoted to uh, imaginative realism. And it's a collector's event. So only people who make actual traditional art can participate. It's a juried event. And so we all gather once a year in Pennsylvania and you put our artwork on display and people come and say, hey, I like that, I'll find it. And so I do that. And there's another event called the Gen Con Art Show I participate in, which is similar. So I do make my works available for sale at certain events. But I got to confess, a lot of it's sitting in flat files. Um, no! <laughs> um, some of it's uh, on the walls of my office. I'm looking at it right now. The piece you're talking about is in the flat file right now. So it is funny because our dining room, I've covered all the walls, literally, <laughs> with the art. And I do have it in the office. And yeah, there is a lot of art piling up. So I got to sell more. Um, <laughs> It's in the flat files. We have these three or four big flat files, and we're, we're filling it up with the art. So, yeah, it is something I have to carefully store. Yeah. Did, why is it not being seen? It should be somewhere. Well, it's interesting. Well, it's funny you mentioned the social media because I actually was cleaning out the flat files to make more room. And I ended up posting a whole bunch of my own animation stuff that I stumbled on and people were getting kicked out of that too. There's a lot of animation art sitting in those flat files too. If we ever had a fire, it'd be very sad. <laughs> I actually, I saw stuff, like you had like stuff for the genie. Yeah. So yeah. what was that from? Because that's not you haven't worked on it or that's you working on something else that had the genie in it or that was just sample work or where is that from? When I was at Walt Disney Television Animation, I spent most of my time there in a group called Special Projects. Okay. And we were uh, almost like a small studio within the big studio. And what they did was when they didn't maybe know how to fit a project into their normal pipeline, it wasn't a regular TV show, they turned to Special Projects and said, do this. <laughs> And so this was one of the projects that our division was asked to create and what is called Genie's Great Minds Think for Themselves. Huh. It was a series of 90-second um, educational shorts. They were bumpers that they put on television, on ABC. And the Library of Congress was involved, and we had Robin Williams providing the voice for the genie. And we made 14 of them about different famous Americans. And it was, it was really a lot of fun. And Robin took the scripts that were written, and he just improv -ed. He just went yeah. off. And they were like three or four page scripts. But for every one of those, there was like hours of material. And my boss would sit in his office, the producer, Gary Katona, and he'd just be listening and he'd be laughing <laughs> the hell because it was so funny. Yeah. But he had to cut that down to 90 seconds. Oh. And so he would cut them down to 90 seconds. And I was, again, we were a small group. So I was one of two storyboard artists that worked on it. Okay. And my role in special projects, I mean, I think I was called a storyboard artist, but I would do animation. I would do prop and character design. I even painted a background once. And I would do whatever needed to be done. Yeah. I did digital uh, work, Photoshop and After Effects and even some 3D work. And, you know, whatever needed to be done, we'd figure out how we were going to make it happen. And uh, my good friend Woody Yoakum and I worked together there. Woody is uh, an animator. He's been around a long time. And he was the timing director. And I was the board artist. And... We just had a lot of fun making those shows. They really were a blast. And if you ever see them, I think so. there's some up on YouTube. I'm in some of the, we used photographic material that we kind of cut and pasted. So I'm, my image is in there in places and so are other people we worked with. And then one of the other artists working on the show did caricatures okay. kind of based on people we worked with. So some of the executives at the studio became characters in the show. It was a lot of fun. We had a good time. But when you saw some of the animation, it was very strange. Strange. We were on a very tight schedule because it was a you know just these ninety second shorts, and so we would have like a week to do the storyboards, and then we'd ship it because overseas is where they normally would do the animation, and then they would ship it back. And we usually had I think a week in order to do all the cleanup and digital stuff and put it together because we were just getting the genie animated and everything else we were building in the studio, and then we'd composite the uh, production and get it ready for TV. And some of the stuff came back, and they hadn't finished animating it. <laughs> <laughs> like it just stopped <laughs> we didn't have 
some time to call them up and say, hey, you guys didn't finish it. So they say, Chuck, you got to finish that. So, <laughs> and then a few times we had retakes where there were some changes. There was like a problem with some of the facts in the scripts oh, were not yeah. quite right. Yeah. So we had to make script-based changes oh, yeah. and rewrite. <laughs> and those rewrites meant re-recording Robin. And then, again, we didn't have time. So I ended up having to reanimate those scenes. So I oh, remember... Wow. There was some stuff about the Koya that I had to reanimate in the Einstein piece. And the other ones were just, they literally just didn't finish animating the scenes. So I had to sit down and animate them. Wow. But it was all, really, it was all fun. I mean, these are the <laughs> kind of problems you enjoy having, you know? Yeah. That's why you do this, so you can solve these problems. It was a really fun, exciting project. I really enjoyed being a part of that experience. I got to look that up. That's great. And then when we were originally talking for you to be on the podcast, so you said something about how you do like a painting class. As soon as you said that, I was like, wait a second. He's saying a painting class, so I have to ask, is that just something that you're doing like, oh, I just want to see what it's about, or I'm just finding something to fill up my time? Or is it actually like, I wonder what they can teach me? Oh, what is gosh, yes. Yeah. I have so much I can learn. Wow. I, all my life, I've always taken classes. It's a journey. Yeah. And I, I don't know that you ever get there. Oh my gosh, I'd like to be there. But yeah. it's also part of the fun is being on that journey. So no, there's so much I have to learn. So yeah, I enrolled in a class I'm taking right now. It's online, which makes it kind of easy. I don't have to travel anywhere. But yeah, yeah two hours on Thursday afternoon. And there's this artist who's a, a very accomplished painter who shows and demos what, you know, what he's doing. And then we follow along. And I'm enrolled in a different class this fall with an another artist who I'd studied with prior oh. and it's also online and yeah I, I enjoy continuing to grow and learn and try to become better at what it is I'm trying to accomplish so that's amazing such a great outlook of always being a student even after yeah. amazing yeah. Yeah. yeah I got one more question before we'll do our wrap-up even though okay. this is so interesting but do you see from coming from storyboarding and now being sort of involved with children's literature, do you see creating a story or a book as being very similar to storyboarding, just more pages kind of? Do you see like a lot of similarities there? There are. I think when you are telling stories for animation, the categories are maybe a little more rigid. Oh, okay. So I think there's a little bit more room in literature to dive into a particular place. You write young adults. There's stuff in young adult you could never put that on television <laughs> um, yes. and then a piece that would just never fly and even middle grade yeah i mean there's violence and death that is addressed and with tv there's a lot of things that we had a chicken character doing a groucho marx impersonation and standards and practices are like no what no uh, that, that's <laughs> suggesting a cigar and oh. uh, uh, you can't do that and, and you know things like that that middle grade i you know i've got a character who gets speared in the back that's not going to happen on nickelodeon so right <laughs> <laughs> it's different in that respect yeah i think there's more freedom and there's just more room for different genres i think that when it comes to oh, control and ownership and it's part of the fun of working in entertainment and film and animation that it's team based yeah. But then one of the attractions of being an author is there's a team component work with an editor, but it really is not near as broad of a team. It's a much more focused and it's much more your story. You yeah. have more direct ownership than you ever do. Even if you're a writer director, there's so many people that you're working with who are going to contribute, which again, it's, it's a plus, but it's different. So that's one of the, I'd say, distinctions. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Yeah, well, because that addresses like the structure part of it and then the actual storytelling oh, part of it. Yeah, pacing. Pacing is really different. Okay. Pacing in, in literature is really different than it is for television and film. Yeah. Film, much, much tighter paced. And, you know, in film and television, you, you'll you throw someone right into it on the very first scene and then you'll let them get caught up. And in literature, you're much more likely to spend some time getting your audience to know the characters before you throw them into the mix. It, yeah, pacing is different, and you've all, uh, everyone listening, I'm sure, has read a book that yeah. got made into a movie, and you're like, the book's better. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
And a lot of the time, I mean, there's compromises to what you fell in love with in that story that it just isn't going to translate into that format. I think Hitchcock did it really well. He would try to find books that weren't great books. They were okay. And then he'd make a movie that was fantastic based yeah. on that nugget. And I think when you try to take a classic piece of literature that's already amazing and to translate that, you're already fighting an uphill battle. Now, some people do it really well, but yeah. I mean, I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan. And I know those films are really popular, but to me, they pale so much in comparison to the books. And there's some things about them I find infuriating. Right. Because... I'm in love with that world and the stories is Tolkien told. Yeah, sometimes you want to avoid getting into this conversation with book people of like, you know, the film is obviously not. But for me, I kind of, from the outside, I just like, this is just their way of telling the story. I already know it's not going to be the same. So yeah. my expectations are like not, you know. That <laughs> is right. the right way to look at it. You know, <laughs> the other way is just going to get you frustrated. Right. You know? So yeah. been there, done that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is the right way to look at it. When I was a young person, and I've come to terms with it though, but I love T.H. White's want the future king yeah. and disney's interpretation of sword in the stone of that first third of that book i hated it <laughs> because i just thought they took something that was so wonderful and had such strong visuals and they just threw it away and i yeah. didn't understand why but now i've grown and what you just shared makes much more sense to me today <laughs> i can appreciate the sword in the stone for what it is in fact we actually own an original cell from that film Oh, wow. But early on, and when I was younger, I really didn't like it because I was so enamored of the source material. Right. So, so different. Right. Oh, okay. Wait, we want one more question before wrapping up. I'm going to keep pushing it off because just want to keep the conversation going. Do you watch a lot of animation these days? Is that something that, because it was so much a part that you, like, oh, what are they doing these days or not necessarily? You know, it's always a challenge. The consumption of what you enjoy and the making of it. Yes. Just the balance. <laughs> I do try to stay abreast of what's happening because it's the business that I teach and where I work. And so I don't know if I watch a lot. But I do watch it. And I just watched the Luca. I know it's been out for a month, but I yeah. loved it. Oh, yeah? I thought that was the latest Pixar film. And I read stuff that people seem to think was okay. I, I thought it was wonderful. I really thought it had wonderful heart. Yeah. I loved the designs. I, I really enjoyed Luca a lot. So You know, they went with like a different... Because we actually did... Uh, my co-host and I did an episode for Luca. Oh, that was actually just... Well, recently released, but she was talking about how they went with the style of that animation. They almost went, Pixar usually tries to be more realistic, but they didn't do that. They did more of like the round face kind of look to it, if that makes sense. Like the larger eyes and the, uh, instead yeah, of doing well, a more realistic look. I thought the designs were a lot of fun. And I yeah. thought they were very evocative of that geographic location, the ethnic nature of the folks, the Italian feel I thought was there and the design of the space, the world, the characters. I thought that was really fun. And I also could not help but think, and I don't know anything, I don't have any inside information on that production, but it looked very, very inspired by Ghibli. It looked like they were obviously enamored of Miyazaki's films. And even the name of the town, Porto Rosso, I immediately thought of Porco Rosso, the <laughs> Miyazaki's film. I thought, I don't think that's a coincidence. <laughs> They're making, you know, so an allusion to that because it looked to me so beautifully influenced by the Miyazaki, the Ghibli aesthetic. So I think there was certainly that too, which is of course a much different aesthetic than the Pixar naturalism that you're talking about. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's the term. You know what? One day we'll have to arrange for like watching an animation with an animator and then like how that's going to change some of a viewer's appreciation of what's, what they're watching. That's very interesting we just brought up. I'm going to have to start paying attention to that stuff. <laughs> oh, everything's so deep. It's good. Okay. We'll finally wrap up. Not again, not because I want to, but I'm just watching the time here. So we always end with fill in the blank of I love it when writers, authors, illustrators, animation, stories, directors, whatever do X. And I don't love it when all those nouns or any of those nouns do X. How would you fill in the blank for those? Well, I'll start with the positive one. <laughs> and I love it when the creator, whether it's the writer, the animator, whoever, they create a world in which I can get lost, where I smell the smells and 
feel the wind on my face, a place that just is so real. I feel like I'm there when I'm reading the book yeah. and I don't want to leave. Even if it's scary, I, I still don't want to leave. And what do I not like? I don't like it when, whether it's publishers or agents, they're trying to recapture someone else's success and they're afraid to try something because it's different. I feel like, and I see a lot of just following the crowd. And you know what else? I think part of it might be also, I sometimes feel like there's a real disconnect from the audience. Yeah. I sometimes feel like the creators aren't thinking about the kids enough. Huh. And I read a, a quote about a month or two ago on Twitter, and this is summarizes to some extent something I really don't like about the industry. He wrote, publishing isn't an industry, it's a casino, and we're all rolling the dice. Agents and editors have read that How to Win at Blackjack book, but we have no clue what the dealer is holding and hitting it big is more luck than skill. I found that very, I don't know. I feel like I've seen that. I've seen this lack of really knowing what I'm doing. And I feel like that's not something to tout. <laughs> Why don't we step back and look at what really captures people in these stories and try to find that instead of trying to copy what someone else did. So that's, that's my negative side. Yeah. Very good. Much to think about. Well, I also want to say anything else because I want to like hold the moment. <laughs> Let, Chuck, thank you so much for speaking with me today. It's been so, so in insightful to speak with you. Well, thank you for having me. And can I just add a little plug for SUWI? Sure. Because this organization in the SoCal region in particular, the community of people who I've had the chance to build a relationship with, and it's mostly been the illustrators, but also with writers like yourself. It's really what makes, for me, this organization important. It's these people, these individuals who I get to see and interact with on a monthly basis, who support me and challenge me. That's the magic of SCWI to me. So I just want to put that in there. Yes, agree. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been a bonus episode of Oh My Word podcast featuring Chuck Green. To find out more about Chuck and his fantastic work, please visit the link in the episode notes. To find out more about Oh My Word Podcast, please follow us on Instagram at Oh My Word Podcast. Check us out at eltenenbaum.com. Music is by Tim Burke. Thanks so much for joining us. Catch you next time.